Dear friends, thank you again for joining me on this virtual journey in the footsteps of Jesus during this Easter season. In the first episode, we looked at the early years of Jesus and we imagined what life would have been like in a small peasant hamlet like Nazareth, based on the reconstruction of such a village in Kazarin, uh, in northern Galilee. And we've also explored the so-called lost years of Jesus. This is this interval between the nativity narratives in Luke and Matthew and Jesus' decision to go to the Jordan um, some 20, 25 years later. And we wondered what could have happened in that time when we hypothesized that perhaps this is the period when Joseph and his son Jesus were working as a tech toy, as uh, skilled workers, in the construction of Sepphoris, this new capital city built by the tetrarch Herod Antipas, ruler of Galilee, exactly in this time frame. And Sepphoris, as we saw, is located just four miles outside of Nazareth. So it's inconceivable that this huge construction project would not have had some impact on the life of Jesus and Joseph. So let us move on to the next and third major story, which is when uh, Jesus decides to go to the Jordan. I'm going to share you my PowerPoint. And this is such an important moment because uh, the story of the baptism in the River Jordan by John is something that we see in all four Gospels. As you, as you probably know, uh, the Gospels don't always agree on certain things, but this is one of those moments, the baptism by John the Baptist, uh, that is featured as a major event in all the four Gospels. And while we're on the subject of the Gospels, one thing that I have not yet done and really should do at this stage is talk a little bit about those documents because from here on forward, our story will be largely led by what the four evangelists are, are telling us. So the chronology is roughly as follows. And of course, none of this is cast in stone. This is all based on uh, historical research on hypothesis, but I would argue that uh, the majority of scholars agree that this is the most likely sequence of the four Gospels. Around the year 30 AD in the Common Era, as we will see in our last podcast, uh, Jesus goes to Jerusalem, uh, is crucified, and is resurrected, conceivably during Passover of 30 AD. Um, others believe it may have been a little later, but uh, for the argument, for our argument, I'm going to assume it was 30, 30 AD. Then the earliest writings about Jesus are not the Gospels, uh, it's actually the letters of Paul. So uh, Paul's letters, which he wrote to the various Christian communities that he founded all over Asia Minor, which is today's Turkey, as well as in uh, Greece. Uh, those letters that he wrote and many other letters that were written under his name but by his disciples uh, are put us somewhere in the, in the early to mid 50s. So uh, at least 20, perhaps 25 years after the Easter events of, of 30. These are the earliest documents. And then the Gospel of Mark is the first one. For many of you, that's a bit surprising because when you open up a Bible, the first Gospel that you see is the Gospel of Matthew. And so you would naturally assume that that's the first and original one. Uh, the church fathers who put together the canon of uh, the Gospels, the official canonical Gospels, uh, roughly around in the fourth century, uh, believe that Matthew was the most authoritative and the most detailed. And so they put him first. But historically, for us as historians, it's Mark's gospel that is the first. And my hypothesis is that this gospel was written in response to the outbreak of a war in Judea and surrounding territories, including Galilee, in 66. 
which was the Jewish rebellion against the Roman occupation. And this became a very bloody affair. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, legions were an expeditionary force, we would call it today, was sent to Judea. Uh, they disembarked in Galilee. And from there, these legions made their way through Galilee and Judea, of course, creating havoc uh, wherever they went. And um, since Mark I am, probably lived in Rome uh, as part of a Christian community, perhaps a Christian Jewish community in Rome, there was naturally a, a motivation to distance Jesus, who after all came from uh, Roman Palestine, to distance Jesus from the rebellion that was then going on at that time. Sometimes I, I make a parallel between you know, the 9-11 events you know, and the, the terrible anti-Islamic sentiment that swept across America in the wake of that 9-11, of those 9-11 attacks. So it is, to me, it seems very human and obvious that that Christian community living in Rome uh, would be at pains to distance themselves from the rebellion in uh, Judea going on at that time and to say, look, we're, we believe in Jesus the Messiah, but we're still patriots, you know, we're not, we're not anti-Roman. So that would have been a reason uh, for Mark uh, to be commissioned to write that gospel. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get closer to the, the passion of Christ. Uh, then uh, there's an interval of about 15, maybe 15, 20 years. And then you see two other uh, Gospels being written, uh, that of Matthew and Luke. And it's interesting, uh, through uh, text analysis, we've been able to identify that uh, as much as half or more, some, some people believe three quarters, of Mark's gospel made their way into that of Matthew and Luke. Of course, they paraphrased and they, they made some of the stories a little bit more elegant. You know, the, the Greek that Mark writes in, which we call koine, is a very, very straightforward Greek. You know, short sentences, this is what happened, this is what happened, and then this, and then this. And you see that Matthew and Luke really try to tell the story with much greater flourishes and much more allusions to Hebrew scripture and do a fantastic job doing that. But still, as one scholar wrote, it seems that Matthew and Luke wrote their gospels with Mark's gospel on their lap. So clearly for them, that was a, a, a great reference, but not the only reference, as we will see in a moment. And then <clears throat> near the end, we have another gospel, that of John. And John is, John's gospel is very different from the preceding three gospels in a sense, again, because of their shared uh, provenance. Mark, Matthew, and Luke are often called the synoptic gospels, which comes from the Greek word synoptikon, which means seen together. They're very similar in their scope and their thrust. Their principal message uh, is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Jewish Messiah foretold in Hebrew scriptures. Whereas the Gospel of John has a, has a different motive. Uh, John's Gospel really sees Jesus as the Son of God uh, who has come to redeem mankind. Now, the two are not necessarily, uh, uh, they don't exclude each other. They're, they're very complementary, of course, but that is the principal motive and the principal focus of these uh, four Gospels. John did not write for a Jewish uh, community or even a Christians with a Jewish pedigree. So if John had talked about the Messiah, nobody knew would know what he was talking about because his audience was not Jewish. In fact, you see throughout the John's, John's Gospel, you see that John has to explain certain things like the Passover. Well, you know, the Passover, that's the feast that the Jews celebrate to, to uh, commemorate their rescue from Egypt and so on and so on. So he clearly, John is writing for a different audience with a different motive, uh, more for the world at large, whereas the synopticos, the synoptic gospels really look 
uh, uh, as the Messiah, the message of, of the Messiah, still though, of course, for the redemption of, of mankind. Now, you see I have a few gaps <laughs> in this slide. This is not death by PowerPoint, I promise you. We're gonna see some pictures soon. Now, in between these four gospels, some other interesting documents were being produced as well. So let's go back to that same slide. We have the Easter events. And then between the Easter events and the development of the first gospel, we believe that traditions, oral traditions, were circulating about what Jesus said, what he was talking about, his teachings in the greater community of Galilee, Judea, and ultimately carried by missionaries or merchants, sailors, soldiers. Those stories were then carried throughout uh, the greater Roman Empire. Uh, of course, then Paul comes into play. He starts to write his letters. And between Paul's letters and the first gospel, that of Mark, we believe that these oral traditions were beginning to be recorded in what we call sayings documents. Now, these are documents that are not particularly interested in telling the story of Jesus. They're merely uh, replicating, describing his statements. This was a very common format in uh, Greco-Roman history. Every philosopher, every sage of some renown at one point or another had his statements, his teachings put on paper. Thus, of course, we hear about Socrates from Plato. If it weren't for Plato, we would never know who Socrates was. You know, we, we have no uh, historical attestation of Socrates, the philosopher himself. Everything we know about Socrates comes from Plato. A similar situation here. So everything we know about Jesus comes from oral traditions, which then are recorded in sayings documents, not yet with a particular theological focus, but these are documents that are written down and these begin to be circulated amongst the various Christian communities in the Mediterranean basin. And, and some of these uh, have survived. Now, um, scholars don't agree about the dating of these documents, but I personally, I believe that one of them, the Gospel of Thomas, which is not a gospel, it's simply a list of statements, uh, is one of those first century sayings documents. You can download it from the, from, from the web, it's free. Just Google uh, Gospel of Thomas and, and read it, it's fairly short. But every verse is simply a statement. Jesus said, and there we go. And interestingly enough, much of what this sayings document says about Jesus, we would later see in the Gospels. So I believe that these saying do sayings documents then became the principal source for the evangelists, given the fact that, as we saw, uh, they did not live in Judea or Galilee themselves. For example, as we saw, Mark probably wrote in Rome. Um, and then we have that Jewish war, which breaks out in 66. And between the Gospel of Mark and the other two Gospels out of Luke and Matthew, we have a very important book being published, quote unquote, uh, in Rome by a, a Jewish uh, historian called Josephus. Uh, now, Josephus lived a generation later than Jesus, but he was very much involved in the war against the Romans. He was put in charge of a, a company of soldiers, uh, rebel, rebels in Galilee. So he saw firsthand uh, of what these troops were doing. Now, he was eventually captured uh, and brought into the presence of Vespasian, who at the time was the general in command of Rome's expeditionary forces. And, you know, by all expectations, he would have been led up after meeting the emperor and he would have been killed. The only reason why he merited an interview with the Vespasian is because he was of a priestly family and sort of a VIP, a VIP rebel commander, if you will. But while in the presence of 
the, of, of Vespasian, General Vespasian, uh, Josephus told, uh, told this general, guess what? Uh, you're going to be an emperor at one point. Uh, you're going to be an emperor of Rome. And uh, Vespasian had a good laugh. Uh, and then he sort of scratched his head and he said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you. We're going to see if your prophecy comes, uh, comes, comes true. And uh, of course, uh, after a period of, of civil war, at one point there were like four different claimants running around trying to get uh, the throne in Rome. Um, Vespasian was proclaimed emperor by his troops, uh, which is why he went back to Rome to claim his crown, took Josephus with him, and his son Titus then continued the prosecution of the war against the Jews and so forth. And so it is his son Titus, General Titus, who was responsible for the destruction of the temple in, in Jerusalem in 70, 70 AD. So to make a very long story short, why is this important? Why, why do I need to hear the story? Josephus was then commissioned by Vespasian to write the official history of the war the Jewish war. And so we have an incredibly valuable eyewitness account of someone who was born in that area, who operated in Galilee, who also observed all of the customs and the, and the different things that went on in those pivotal years before the Jewish war. And all that he described in this book, The, the Jewish War. Uh, of course, it's entirely pro-Roman. Well, you know, you have a Roman emperor paying for the, for the book, so you know, you're not going to say anything that's going to be uh, uh, great offense to, to the emperor. But um, Vespasian was very, very pleased. Uh, and then uh, the book became a bestseller, uh, if you will, in, in Rome's circles. It was very well uh, received. So that after Matthew and Luke write their Gospels, Josephus, as authors typically do, who have a best-selling book, they do a sequel, right? And so Josephus then wrote a different book, which is far more detailed, less, uh, he's no longer a protege of the Flavian house at that point. So uh, Vespasian was a member of the Flavian house. He, he, that's his dynasty that he founded. Uh, and so he writes his second book. And this second book is less a propaganda piece for uh, the Flavian house of Vespasian. It's more of a balanced history. Some people refer to it as the antiquities of the Jews. Um, I'm not sure what, what that translation means. We're not talking about you know, chests or tables or anything like that. The, the proper translation is the history of the Jews. And this is an extremely valuable book. You can also download it for free from, uh, from the internet, although there are now new modern translations that are far more accessible. So, in this talk, in, in these talks that I will be giving uh, with you, um, uh, Josephus is, is, is a very important source for understanding what went on in this time frame, particularly the time frame after, um, after Jesus. And you will see, for example, that uh, Josephus has an extensive description uh, of John the Baptist, uh, which attests to his prominence, uh, as well as. Um, a, uh, a chapter, well, not really a chapter, it's more like half a page about Jesus. Unfortunately, uh, that uh, paragraph or so, it's about half a page, has been so doctored uh, by the monks in the Middle Ages who, of course, were very useful in, in transmitting the ancient documents to the modern time. But as these monks transcribed Josephus, they could clearly see, well, he, he obviously doesn't understand the importance of Jesus. So they added some text, which we call interpolations. And in my book, I try to isolate those interpolations so you can see what Josephus, I believe, originally wrote and what the monks added. So uh, the, original, the original text is still extremely valuable to understanding how Jesus was perceived in the immediate decades after the, the Easter events.
Okay, we're, we're done now with PowerPoint for a while. <laughs> oh, not quite. Uh, I also need to tell you a little bit about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who obviously play such a pivotal role uh, in the story uh, of Jesus and uh, uh, walking in his footsteps. Now, we, we hear about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, the evangelists, and particularly Matthew and Mark, uh, depict them as the antagonists of Jesus. Don't forget, this is the time when the official Jewish um, uh, elites, uh, such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were closely associated with the rebellion against Rome, so that obviously they're cast in a very, very dark light. But as we see in the next episode, in my next episode, The Kingdom of God, I believe that's not really accurate. I believe that whereas the Sadducees were truly uh, foes of what Jesus was trying to do, that the Pharisees, on the other hand, was sort of understood what he was going for and, and had much sympathy for what he was doing. After all, it is a Pharisee, let's not forget, who gave his tomb uh, to Jesus. And it is a Pharisee, once again, who also defended the apostles when they were arrested after the Easter event. So all of these things uh, lead me to believe that the uh, affinity between Jesus and the Pharisees was much closer than the Gospels would lead us to believe. In any case, where, where were these people? Where were these people? Well, in the century, I'll be very quick about it because we want to get back to the story of John the Baptist. But in the century before Jesus, Jewish life had become increasingly polarized. Uh, not unlike the way, unfortunately, in our country, you know, we become so polarized. Uh, between left and right. And, uh, that's a different story, of course. The reason why in, in uh, the Hasmonean kingdom, the kingdom immediately prior to that of Herod the Great, these factions occurred is because during that one century that we talked about in my first podcast, when for a brief moment, for like 90 plus years, uh, Israel was once again free, free of foreign occupation, they were led by the Hasmonean dynasty, and that was great. Everything was wonderful, except for one thing. The Hasmonean kings decided to also give themselves the job of the high priest. That's right. So imagine today if the prime minister of Italy, the poor man, he's going through a, facing a lot of challenges, but let's, for argument's sake, imagine that the Prime Minister of Italy also decided to become a Pope. <laughs> that's, the, that's the allegory that, that this, this signifies. And of course, Jews were, pious Jews, observant Jews, were, were shocked by this. And so in the reaction to that, you have two different uh, groups. You have the priestly aristocratic Sadducees. These are very conservative folks. Uh, they don't believe that there is any scripture beyond the Torah, the five books of Moses for them, the books of the prophets, uh, the Psalms, this is not revealed scripture for them. It's the, it's the Torah, and more importantly, the Torah is fixed. It cannot be debated, it cannot be discussed. It's there, it's written in stone, that's it. And then you have the more liberal, now I don't mean that in a political sense, I mean that in a more of a philosophical sense. You have the more liberal brotherhood, for lack of a better term. Some of these may have been priests. Many of them were lay people, but they were the Pharisees, the Perushim, they, the, the people who separated themselves, that's what the Hebrew word means, from the uh, Sadducees. And they, they advocated a very different approach. Uh, they believed that um, the, the books of the prophets, which is the second division of Hebrew scripture, uh, was revealed scripture. And most importantly, they didn't think that the Torah, the Jewish law, was, was cast in stone. They believed that times were changing. And so it was up to uh, inform people, rabbis, scholars, to constantly debate the meaning of the Torah for everyday life. And those debates would eventually be uh, recorded and documented, and finally published in a collection called the Mishnah, which is the first instance uh, 
of that happening. And then, of course, we have the whole Talmudic tradition, the Talmud uh, thing uh, happening from that point on. So the Mishnah is also a very important document. So that's the situation that we had. Now, uh, these two were jockeying for power, okay? They were both jockeying for power, particularly uh, in the most important legislative and judicial body of the time, which continued into the era of Herod the Great and the era of Jesus, which was the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. Don't forget, the Jewish law was a real law. It wasn't just for, you know, the temple uh, or sacrificial rights. No, it was, it was a legislative body for how Jewish society should, should operate. So naturally, the Sanhedrin had not only religious power, but also legislative power, to a certain extent, of course. And the Sanhedrin was retained, even when uh, Judea became Roman occupied. Uh, we have Herod the Great coming in as a vassal king to do Rome's bidding. Herod was smart enough to give the Sanhedrin uh, to respect that body and to, to retain uh, its, its autonomy in terms of religious matters and judicial matters insofar as these judicial issues did not trespass on Roman law. Very important. We're going to talk about Roman law when we come to the Passion. It's extremely important to understand Roman law as it relates to the Passion of Christ. Extremely important. So anyway, the, the Sanhedrin operated uh, fairly autonomously through all of these various occupations, but after about 103, still during the Hasmonean kingdom, the Sadducees, with the help of the Hasmonean kings, basically took control of that body, the Sanhedrin, largely because they acquiesced in the idea that a king could also be a high priest, which of course the Pharisees thought would be repulsive. There's a third group, the Essenes, I'm not going to talk about that, but they were even so, so terribly shocked they removed themselves from society and formed their own community. So those are, those are the things happening. So it's important to realize that when, when we talk about the Pharisees and Jesus, that at that time, the Pharisees were not completely bereft of political power, but they were marginalized. They were no longer, they were a minority voice on the Sanhedrin, a vocal voice, but a minority voice. And so they tried to find other ways to keep themselves relevant. And they decided to transfer the, the purity cult of the temple. As you know, the Jewish law is a lot about purity, how to retain purity and everything you touch, everything you use, to one's home and living sphere. And in a sense, to, to sort of um, decentralize the, the sanctity of the temple and to bring that sanctity, that spirituality into your own home, which of course is today what, what rabbinic Judaism is all about. In those days though, it was still a very, very new idea. And so the gospel sort of poke fun at the Pharisees and deride the fact that they always go on and on about you know, purity, this and purity, that. When we, in my next podcast, uh, I will put a little bit of a different slant on those discussions. Uh, anyways, so now we have John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is an extremely important figure. You know, the Gospels have sort of, um, how do I say this nicely, have sort of um, limited his role in history as a messenger of Jesus as the Messiah, and that, that's certainly true. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's clear from both the Gospels and Josephus that uh, John was an extremely powerful orator, and that he could be considered probably the leading dissident uh, of his day. And, and uh, like many dissidents, uh, you know, he sort of um, walked like a hippie. You know, he was, uh, he, he, he played the part. He, he wore the part. You know, he was, uh, he didn't wear normal clothing. No, he had clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt. And he ate locusts and honey. Today we would call him a vegetarian. You know, so he was. He played the part of someone who is an out an outlier, uh, and that's what made him so charismatic. You know, that even the Gospels say that people flocked to John from all over. They wanted to hear him, and you know, John 
you know, uh, he, he didn't mince words, you know, you brood of vipers, he yells at them, you know, <laughs> these poor people, they come on to listen and they're, they're being yelled at, you know, but that was John's style, you know, that was John's style. And what John was saying is, um, you know, we need to come back to the principles of the, of the, of, of the law, you know, the, the principle of the law, the way we're, our country is contaminated by Roman Greek culture by nude statues, and we have all these things that Herod built. We got to get back to the base. We got to get back to uh, the essence of the of the Jewish law. And and Mark, uh, very oh, I'm sorry, uh, Matthew very cleverly uh, models uh, John in the image of Elijah, who after all was one of the first prophets in Hebrew scripture. Who in Matthew's view. Um, prophesied the coming of the Messiah. You can see uh, the, the language is almost similar. So what really what Matthew is saying, and Matthew is a brilliant, brilliant writer. Of all the four, I think he is the most erudite because he knows Hebrew scripture backwards and forwards. When I talk about Hebrew scripture, of course, I refer to what Christians call the Old Testament. Um, and so, and, and, and so you see throughout Matthew's gospel, many very uh, in, uh, interesting allusions to Hebrew scripture uh, in the sense that, that these prophets uh, prophesy the coming of, of Jesus the Messiah. Uh, now, this is the, the gospel view. If you go to Josephus, uh, um, you get pretty much the same view. And then, don't forget, Josephus is not a Christian. Uh, he was raised as a Jew, um, but when he got to Rome, he operated in a completely Gentile, pagan milieu, uh, writing for the Roman emperor, who didn't particularly have a lot of love for the Jewish people since he just got back from fighting them. So, it's in, so that's why Josephus uh, has a considerable amount of credibility in what he's writing. And he says about John the Baptist, John the baptizer, he commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, righteous towards one another, and piety towards God. Now, we will hear Jesus say pretty much the same thing. Remember when they ask him, what is the most important commandment? Love one another as yourself and, and love God. And here is this, this Roman historian saying pretty much the same thing in the words of John the Baptist. So clearly John, um, I think, had a, uh, I meant to say he's a mentor of Jesus, maybe pushing it, but clearly uh, John's teachings, his, his, his speeches, clearly must have made a, an impact on, on Jesus. And then Josephus says, uh, and that's why he, he does baptism, not to, for people to gain remission for some sins, but for the purification of the body. This is the Jew speaking. This is the Jewish historian speaking, okay? The Christians, the Christian gospels say exactly the opposite. You know, the baptism is not for the purification of the body. It is for the remission of sins, right? That's what Paul says. So this is interesting. You see, you have, you have, uh, clearly uh, what we can conclude from that is that these two ideas that, you know, you, you, you clean your body through baptism, but really... And it also is related in some way or form to remission of sins. Those two, those two ideas were clearly very much uh, at the forefront of his activity. And, and so this is how they were communicated. And then Josephus says, you know, many people came in crowds to him, for they were greatly moved by his words. The gospel says almost exactly the same sentence. Lots of crowds came to John to hear him. Isn't that amazing? So clearly we're talking about a very prominent person. I found this in the, um, in the Israel Museum, beautiful museum. Uh, and this is exactly the belt that I imagined that John the Baptist wore. This actually is from the second century. It was found in a cave, the Cave of Letters. But you can imagine that John the Baptist strutted around, you know, with, with a belt like this uh, around his, his loins. You know, that's, that's nice. So, um, why did Jesus join John the Baptist at this particular time? Uh, why not sooner? Uh, we, we heard in our, my last podcast that the construction of Sepphoris was suspended sometime between 17 and 20 AD when Herod Antipas decided to uh, move and create a second city, 
Tiberius on the shores of Galilee uh, on, on, on ground that had previously served as a cemetery. So he clearly didn't want any Jews involved because it was obviously impure ground. Um, and so what happens in those intervening bit? Why did, did Jesus not come to John sooner? Why is it exactly according to your know, hypothesis, once again, is around 28, 28 that time. Why is that the moment when, when Jesus goes to John the Baptist? And Luke gives us very, very clear historical framework for assessing that this was around 28 AD in our chronology that, that, uh, that Jesus went to the Jordan. And once again, we're very grateful to Luke. Luke is the historian. Matthew is the poet. Luke is the historian. And Luke always frames his stories with, in the year of, you know, so for historians, this is wonderful because we can really turn, uh, figure out when it happened. But why then? Here is why. This is my hypothesis. You don't have to uh, follow it. But this is why. In 28, something really, really bad happened. Really, really bad. And as we saw in a previous podcast, Pilate, the prefect, Pilate, the prefect of Judea, was not a nice person at all. Uh, at every turn, he tried to provoke the Jews because he thought that the exemptions that were given them by Emperor Augustus were way out of control. And that's why the reason he, he felt that's why they are such an insidious people. That's why they are always prone to rebellion. Well, the second thing that was happening is that the reason why a person like Pilate took a job as the prefect in, uh, in a place like Judea, which was not a plum assignment, you know, if you went to Gaul, you know, you could enjoy French cuisine. If you went to Spain, uh, they had wonderful climate. Uh, they had mines of silver and gold. Uh, so Judea was not necessarily a plum assignment, but for, for a man like him, the principal incentive for taking on the role as a prefect, which typically was a term of three years, was to make money. That's it, was to make money. How much money? A million sesterces, please. Why a million sesterces? That's how you, if you deposited that capital, if you owned a million sesterces, you were qualified to become a senator, which of course was the upper elite of Roman society. So everybody who was not a senator, who was assigned to an overseas assignment, the Veres, you know, the story of Veres, for example, in, in Cicero's book, uh, their incentive was to make money, to make money, to make money, as much money as possible, uh, before you, know, you were uh, recalled. Uh, and, and to so have used those three years wisely because you needed to uh, get as much money as you can. And uh, very, uh, very early on, Pilate found a kindred spirit in Caiaphas, the high priest. What I'm telling you, it, it's not a reflection at all on Second Temple Judaism. There is uh, considerable circumstantial evidence that Caiaphas, who after all came from a family uh, appointed by Herod the Great, you know, Anas, his father-in-law, many other members of his family served in the position of high priest because they were essentially collaborating with Herod the Great and, and that collaboration with Herod the Great continued after Judea became a crown province. And so Caiaphas had no problem collaborating with whoever was the prefect of the Roman uh, crown province of Judea, uh, as long as the peace was kept and sacrificial rites could continue and everything was hunky-dory. Now, Pilate, must have hatched a plan with, um, with uh, Caiaphas because he had, of course, seen this beautiful temple, which was still under construction at the time. It took many, many decades for this great temple to be built uh, under originally initiated by Herod the Great. And he had seen uh, that, um, that priests, chief priests, uh, typically had a, a, a mikveh, this is a ritual bath. That's what you use to cleanse yourself ritually uh, in their homes. Of course, the chief priests and the high priests had very lavish mansions, as we will see in the episode of, of the Passion. Uh, the problem is, where, where are you going to get the water from? <laughs> the, to, uh, you know, don't forget these migvaot, uh, plural of migveh, uh, 
It required running water, not still water, running water. Only running water was able to, to create that sense of purity. And so, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Pilate approached Caiaphas and said, I got an idea. You know, we, us Romans, uh, we, we have this thing called, uh, this technology called, it's called an aqueduct. And uh, I, you know, and obviously uh, here is one just like it. Uh, Herod the Great built that to supply his uh, city of Caesarea. He says, what if us with our brilliant sense of engineering, uh, I have Roman architects come over and we built this, this aqueduct to bring water from the hills into Jerusalem and you'll never have to worry about running water ever again. And, you know, we're, we're talking primarily, of course, the, the Sadducees, the, the homes of the Sadducees that had private mikvot. And uh, Caiaphas, that's a great idea. He says, who's going to pay for it? And, and, uh, and Pilate said, you are. Because he knew that the temple in those days collected the tithes from all over not only all over Judea and Galilee, but all over the diaspora, as we saw in a previous podcast. So every year, the tithes for the temple were collected around the Roman Empire, and all that flowed into a treasury called the Korban. And that treasury uh, became quite substantial. And so Pilate had been eyeing that Korban, and, and he knew that that treasury um, uh, which was based in the temple, uh, sort of at, as a central bank of sorts. I mean, the major financial I uh, issues were, were handled by the Korban. And so he figured, since uh, Judea has no mines uh, to speak of, uh, they have, Judea has no uh, wood, uh, as in Lebanon, uh, so where, where the hell can I make money? And he says, that's the, ca that's the source of capital. So he pitched Caiaphas on this idea, and Caiaphas says, well, yeah, I, I think I, we can do that. And so, obviously, uh, by commissioning an aqueduct to Jerusalem, uh, obviously, Pilate would have to act as the uh, manager-in-chief, for which, obviously, he would require a fee. So, we're not sure how much, but, you know, clearly, uh, Pilate was trying to he used this as an excuse to get capital from the Korban into his treasury, ostensibly to build an aqueduct, but of course, a large amount would have been skimmed off for Pilate's own purposes. Well, to make a very long story short, dear friends, the minute that rumor spread, of course, you can't keep this quiet, you know, that Caiaphas and Pilate were in cahoots to use this sacred money. The, 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 the blood and toil and sweat of Jewish peasants and workers all over the Roman world to build a Roman aqueduct under supervision of Pilate, there was an outcry. And a massive demonstration was held in the forecourt that you see right here, uh, the, the court of the Gentiles. And uh, you know what Pilate did? Pilate came to Jerusalem you see the Antonia Fortress, which was built by Herod the Great, especially for these occasions, because when Herod designed this big sanctuary, he realized that this was a perfect place for spontaneous rebellions, as indeed would happen in 4 BC, and would happen many times since. And because the forecourt was always a, had a lot of potential for trouble, he built a military barracks overlooking the temple. And you can imagine Roman soldiers up here in those towers looking down on the temple with their weaponry. And whenever trouble broke out, as we would see in 30 AD, they would run in there and, and quell it. And so what happens during this demonstration in 20 AD, they, they mixed amongst the people, the demonstrators, in civilian clothing. And at a sign of their of Pilate, they threw off their cloak and they killed everyone in sight. That's right. They killed everyone in sight. Now imagine the shock of such a event. Uh, innocent men, women, children being cut down 
by Roman swords, only for protesting this aqueduct business. Now, I, I can imagine that the shockwave of that massacre reverberated all over the country. And I can imagine that in that shockwave, many, many young men and women, idealistic men, men and women said, we're gonna do it, we're gonna have to do something. This, this is it. This, this is beyond, absolutely beyond the pale. And I believe that is the moment when Jesus may have decided to join the most prominent dissident of his day, John the Baptist. It's my hypothesis. Uh, it's just a theory. It may not be true, but I do find the confluence of those two events, Jesus' decision to go to John the Baptist in 20 AD, as described by Luke, and the temple massacre happening in the same time frame. I find it very compelling. And so Jesus came to the Jordan. I took this picture in one of the many tributaries of the Jordan. You can imagine, you know, this is what a beautiful place. What a beautiful place this is. You know, you can imagine John speaking to his followers and then leading them one by one into the waters of the Jordan, the running waters, the running waters of the Jordan, to be cleansed uh, of body and spirit, to be cleansed of body and, and spirit. And, and so Jesus joins uh, the, the Baptist. And now something very interesting is happening in the Gospels, because the Gospels say, uh, and beginning with Mark, that a voice called out from the clouds the moment that John baptized Jesus and said, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. What Mark is doing, which is quite exceptional because usually it's Matthew who does these things, but what Mark is doing is he's combining Psalm 2.7, you are my son, with Isaiah, my chosen in whom my soul delights. Isn't that beautiful? And that phrase is then repeated verbatim in all the other Gospels, even in the Gospel of John. So clearly what we're dealing with here is a historical event. There is no doubt in my mind that this is what happened, that Jesus came to the Jordan and that for him this was the moment when he received his mission. This was the moment when he received the, 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 the vision of his ministry and the purpose of why he was put on earth to begin with. At that point, it was revealed to him. And, and, and Mark does that so beautifully in his gospel. Uh, and then the, the Baptist's following would become sort of a model of, for Jesus' own ministry. Of course, there are major differences. But most important, the, 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 the evangelist who, who draws a straight line from John the Baptist's movement into the movement of Jesus is surprisingly is the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John tells us then that uh, several disciples, notably Andrew, told his brother Simon, later known as Simon Peter, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Messiah. And it's, it's that one. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, he is the Messiah. And, uh, and they're soon joined by a third disciple called Philip. Now, that's kind of important, as we, will, as we will see in a moment. So this is the core of Je the, the beginning of the movement of Jesus. So it is out of the, the following of John the Baptist, according to John. That is the, 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 the core, the, 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 the germ that will ultimately produce Jesus' own following. And then, of course, we have this, this situation where, where John is arrested. Um, and um, the, the Gospels uh, say, give us a very clear reason why that is. You see, Antipas, once again, we saw in, a, in the first episode that Herod Antipas, ruler of Galilee, had this funny arrangement where he was also the, the governor of, or the tetrarch, of Perea, which is that area along the Jordan in which John was operating. The two were not connected at all. It was sort of a weird arrangement. But the ruler of Galilee was also the ruler of uh, Perea, where, where Jordan operated. Now, Antipas was married to the daughter of King Aretas of the Nebatine kingdom, uh, capital, Petra. Uh, 
Uh, the beautiful city of Petra was the capital of the Nabataean kingdom. And uh, Antipas had met a, a beautiful lady called uh, Herodias, who happened to be the wife of his half-brother, Philip. Uh, we're not quite sure which Philip that is, but I'm going to leave that aside for a moment. And she was also the daughter of his half-brother, Aristobulus. Obviously, uh, these endogamic um, uh, marriages were very typical, particularly in the Herodian dynasty, in order to keep the clan close. Uh, people intermarried, uh, an almost incestuous situation, and the same was true for Antipas, who fell in love with this beautiful lady, uh, apart from the fact that she was actually very, very closely related to him. And, and, and John the Baptist, says Mark, took, took um, issue with that, because it says very clearly in Leviticus, uh, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife, particularly if that wife had born children. At that point, you know, she could remarry if her husband died, but she could not marry the brother of her husband. And so that's what John the Baptist says, and, um, and uh, you know, Antipas wasn't really much, much bothered by it. He had people, crazy people, calling him out all the time. But Herodias, <laughs> uh, I will not be ignored. And so <laughs> it's Herodias, who, uh, his, his new wife, who makes sure that uh, John is arrested and, of course, ultimately executed. Uh, Josephus has a very different take on this. Of course, Josephus confirms that John was arrested by Herod Antipas, uh, but he, he doesn't say necessarily that it was because of the, the marriage. I mean, that's a theological uh, discussion. You can agree with it or not. No, what, what, according to Josephus, Antipas was very, very worried that this movement of John the Baptist kept growing and growing and growing. And we all know the history of the recent history uh, what happened uh, just a few decades ago with the outbreak of the rebellion in 4 BC. So according to Josephus, the reason why he arrested John is because he believed John had the power and inclination to raise a rebellion. These are Josephus' words. And so Antipas, according to Josephus, said that by putting him to death, he would prevent any mischief that he might cause. And that's why John was put to death. Neither contradict one another, the gospel view or the historical view of Josephus. I think they're complementary. I think they both added up to a very good reason for Antipas, who, again, had jurisdiction over Perea. And let's not forget, Rome was looking over his shoulder to make sure he kept the peace. So that's why Antipas decided on a preemptive strike before another rebellion could erupt, similar to the one that had taken place after the death of King Herod. And that's why poor John uh, is beheaded. Uh, of course, Salome is the girl who asks for John's head. Poor girl, probably not knowing who John was, because her mother, Herodias, saw her chance when Herod Antipas, enchanted by Salome's dancing, said, child, tell me, what can I give you? And Herodias whispered in her daughter's ear, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And that's, of course, what happened. And where does the story take us next? In my next podcast, the story shifts to Bethsaida. Bethsaida, you ask? Why not Capernaum? We're going to get there. But the next episode, in the kingdom of God, we're going to follow the ministry of Jesus uh, from his launch point in the synagogue of Capernaum and throughout the region and ultimately even the Gentile world. So thank you, dear friends, uh, for joining me for this podcast. And uh, join me again in episode number four in the kingdom of God. Thank you.